This video is sponsored by Maso CNC Controller, but a little bit more information on them later. Let's talk about design. If you recall from my video those many months ago, we got about here. Electronics, check. Code, <sighs> check. Mechanical assembly, just missing the extrusion screw. One part, easy. Normally when you design something, there's a fairly prescribed set of steps. I may do a video on them because for my part, it's pretty clear that I'm more successful when I actually follow them. There are two major flaws that I'm a little worried about with the injection molding machine at the moment. The first one is that the screw and barrel are a little bit too short, so it's going to be pretty difficult to isolate all that heat to just that small volume. And the other big problem is that it's actually pretty difficult to make the screw, especially on manual machines. So the screw and the barrel are short. There's not much distance between the extruder heat source and the rest of the machine, and most of that distance is through aluminum, which is basically a really good conductor of heat. The first few parts might be great, but after the tent, the entire machine might be 200 Celsius and the electronics might have melted. There's also no water cooling, although fortunately there's a little bit of space to add some. So for the screw, not designing something that can be easily machined is a pretty rookie mistake. We've all heard stories of parts that had to be gun drilled because the junior engineer accidentally set his whole wizard in SolidWorks to through all, not blind hole 12 millimeters deep. Peter Stanton would then shrug and start work on a new drilling fixture. Modern machines make it much easier to be sloppy. If I designed the screw just like this for work, I wouldn't have felt too badly about it and I probably would have sent it out. Any machine that can cut the gullet of an auger like this should be able to do a taper as well. They could probably have even buried the helix without too much difficulty. This would be made on a CNC lathe with a live tool and probably hand programmed since the moves are fairly rudimentary. Provided I can communicate what's needed to the machine shop, the machinist will be able to handle it. Granted, if I had to spend cold hard cash on it, I probably would have done more heat transfer calculations to make sure the screw wasn't too short. When it comes to me, and many of you, not having access to a CNC lathe with live tooling is a bit of an issue. You could probably get away with threading this. It's a, it's a 10 millimeter pitch, and you'd need a tool that was ground with a 10 degree angle so it didn't interfere on the threads. I can barely grind coffee, let alone a tool like that. I tried it quickly, it didn't work out so well. I realized that I would need some kind of radial cutting spindle pretty early in the process. Enter a new project. I decided to make my own tool post spindle because one, it's me. Two, I needed to be pretty compact so I could get really close to the chuck. And three, I have more time than money. Remember when I said there was a fairly prescribed set of steps when designing something? Let's forget about those and skip ahead to CAD. Sort of kidding there. If this was something important, I would want to know my requirements. I'd vaguely lay out the assembly and then dive into calculations. First, I would check power requirements. Then I would check the bearings, then the bearing arrangement then the power transmission itself. I'd check the factors of safety on the shaft, the bearings, the drive components, maybe the motor flange, and I might even do some FEA. As it happens, I knew I'd be designing using a straight shank ER16 collet holder, whatever bearings would fit that, a motor and a belt drive. Straight shank collet holders are pre-hardened, have a super low run out, they're ground very precisely, and they cost very little. You can pick one of these up from Char's for about $45. Actually, if you'll permit me a small tirade, it was $45, and then $30 shipping, and then it was $30 at the door for duties, and then I just got a $30 brokerage fee several months later. Ah, Canada. It's easy enough to change the motor, the bearings only have to survive making the part, and I can replace the belt as often as I want, so I wasn't too worried about the calculations here. Also, I should note, it's just gonna be me using it, and I have sort of a good idea of if it's sounding okay, so I'm not too worried about safety in this case. I should note here that I'm using this as an opportunity to test a new spindle layout that I've been working on. I'm hoping to release a video on that in the future. The basic idea is it's a three-piece spindle instead of a one-piece spindle. So we'll see how that turns out. This video is sponsored by Masso CNC controllers. Masso can run mills, lathes, routers, plasma machines, and more. Simply connect your stepper or servo motor drives to the Masso, then connect a monitor, keyboard, mouse, and a pen drive with your G-code. That's right, you don't need a PC or PC-based control software. This makes Masso super reliable, eliminating all PC drivers or motion car compatibility issues. Masso, the PC-less controller. Powerful, stable, guaranteed. I used a hobby brushless DC motor here. I tried using this really high-end, super precise NEMA 17 brushless DC motor I had lying around, but it just didn't have enough torque. 
If someone can tell me why a NEMA 17 BLDC is 50 watts and this Hobby BLDC is 1800 watts, I'd love to know. Obviously the Hobby motor can take a lot more current, but is that it? I controlled the Hobby motor with a Hobby servo tester and attached it to an electronic speed control. This was all powered by a 24 volt 15 amp power supply. The Hobby setup was designed to be powered by a battery, so it needs a much higher current than 15 amps, but I found it sufficiently terrifying to do the job. When everything was assembled, I put it on the tool post, dropped it below center to avoid center cutting, balanced the power supply on the tailstock, and gunned it. I use scrap end mills because our shop has high standards for end mill condition. And this is at best experimental. The surface speed was way too high, but the motor lacked torque at lower speeds. I found the best way of removing material was plunge milling and then cleaning it up with shallow passes. Overall, it did work. It was just a little scary. So now the screw is finished. I've been getting lots of interest about this machine, which is great, but I suspect a lot of people are going to have difficulty cutting the screw as well. I'm going to fire this thing up and do a video, I promise, but then I might spend a little time afterwards designing a piston cylinder headstock for it. The piston cylinder arrangement, you can sometimes see them on desktop machines. The piston cylinders are not often used in industry because um, the heating isn't very uniform. It'll heat from the outside, but the core of the plastic will stay cold. But for such a small volume, I think it'll be okay. And it'll definitely be a lot easier to make. I'm also having more people ask about how I coded it. Long story short, I use fidgets with a PH, a Python script, and a laptop. I wouldn't recommend it. It's complicated. It's object-oriented programming. I still don't feel like I understand how it's working. Um, and I'm a little embarrassed to show it to people. The right thing to do is to use a 3D printer board running Marlin, which is the freeware uh, 3D printer firmware that's out there. Most 3D printers use a huge list of G-code commands to set temperatures, run axes, etc. So I think the very easiest thing to do would be to make a G-code translator and just use a plug-and-play 3D printer board. Anyways, that's all for now, guys. Hopefully it won't be too long until the next update. As usual, the CAD files and drawings are available to download on my Patreon. I'll aim to have the CAD and drawings up for the tool post spindle soon. Thanks for watching.